No, there is not a rumor of folks looking to leave Forest Hill. No, this is not a topic that is presented uh, for fear of some being disgruntled. And if you are disgruntled, thanks for keeping it a secret. I appreciate that. This is a topic that is relevant because we live in a city where, depending on what source you ask, you can easily find some 30 named congregations. You might find 40, 50, 60, depending on where you look and who's still there and how far your radius is. And when there are a plethora of options, then people must make choices. Seven considerations before switching congregations. It could be the case that there are those that have wondered, do I need to be elsewhere? It could be the case that there are those here today who have been members of other congregations in the area or elsewhere in the nation that are looking to move to this area and considering whether to be a part of Forest Hill. Whatever the case may be, there are a couple of things that must be identified. One, there is a responsibility to identify with the congregation. When Saul, before... Scripture begins calling him Paul when Saul returned to Jerusalem after having traveled to Damascus, having spoken with Jesus on that Damascus road, having ultimately obeyed the gospel some three days later, having spent that time in Damascus teaching, having spent the time in Arabia learning directly from Christ according to Galatians 1, after Saul ultimately returned to Jerusalem, Acts 9, 26, he essayed to join himself unto the brethren. He sought to identify with the church that met in Jerusalem. The brethren were a touch skittish the last they knew of him. He was persecuting the church. Yet he essayed to join himself with a congregation. Please discern between the denominational idea of joining a church that's so often touted today and the distinction of being added to the Lord's church, Acts 2, 47. Saul was doing neither of those. He'd already been added to the Lord's church and he was a saying to be identified with or to link himself to the specific congregation there in Jerusalem. Christians have a responsibility to identify with the congregation. Just like elders have a responsibility to know those that are among them. First Peter 5, 2, Peter would speak to the elders just as he was also an elder. He said, shepherd the church of God which is among you, taking oversight not by constraint but willingly. Peter expected the elders to know who the members were of the congregations that they oversaw, wherever they may have been. The point being this. Elders have a responsibility to know who the members of the flock are. And members of the flock have a responsibility to identify with which eldership or which flock they will be a part. Our topic is not the idea of consider what to consider about a new potential congregation. Our topic is things to consider if you're contemplating a change. Maybe it's the case that there are some that are coming our direction. Maybe it's the case that there are some that are questioning whether they, they need to make a change. Maybe it's the case that you are neither. But even if you're neither, if not today, then tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, there will be someone who is considering these things and someone that will need to be approached with the sort of considerations that will help arrive at the best decision. Some reasons. Why would people be considering a move? Well, for one thing, it could be conviction. There are people that are considering a move because wherever they may be worshiping, there's been a change in doctrine. There's been a change in teaching and practice. Or maybe it's the case that this individual has learned more and realizes something that shouldn't be as it is. There's been a doctrinal change at some point, whether in this person's understanding and growth or in the practice at the congregation or maybe Maybe there are times when some are seeking to change because the congregation is standing strong, but this person is becoming compromised in a doctrinal position. Whatever the case, doctrine, conviction. Sometimes it's a matter of circumstances. Recently moved to an area or just moving within the community. 
and therefore uh, another congregation's meeting location would be a bit more convenient to attend. Sometimes it's a matter of a life change, such as marriage. Sometimes it's a matter of a life change, such as widowhood. Whatever the case, there are different circumstances that can bring about the consideration. Conviction, circumstances, sometimes it's conflict. There are folks that struggle to get along. It's that sort of underlying conflict that uh, no one ever really identifies or puts a finger on it, but it's always there and looming, or perhaps sometimes it's the kind of conflict that is right there, obvious yet unaddressed. Sometimes it's a matter of connections. People looking for uh, another body of Christians wherein they feel like they are better able to relate. Sometimes it's a matter of their being family with another congregation, or maybe they're not being family with a particular congregation, or having friends or other acquaintances with another congregation. It might be a matter of connections, it might be a matter of concerns. Not necessarily sinful, doctrinal, conflict related concerns, but sometimes a philosophy of mindset and leadership, or a matter of unrectified issues, or attitudes toward. Bible school or attitudes toward worship that might be uh, come across as complacent or at least uh, concerning, then there are constraints. Maybe people are considering a move because they feel the, the need for an environment where that's more conducive to growth. Various reasons that would motivate the considerations. What, why do some people switch? Let's look at some research. What do switchers seek? What are they trying to find? The top priorities for those looking for a new church by and large are 85%, rather 83% are looking for quality of preaching. Then the next top on the list is they're looking for a place where they feel welcomed by the leaders. That's about 80%. So what's coming from the pulpit or what kind of connection do they feel with either the pulpit or the leadership? Those are major considerations that people have. The style of worship. Now that could be a good thing, looking for sound worship. Or that might be a negative thing, looking for worship that's all about a particular sound. Whatever the case, the style of worship is a 75% consideration. Location, convenience often plays into it. Quality of children's programs, because how many parents have not questioned whether they have their children in the right place where they are going to uh, be best connected and uh, inserted into the church to learn. Friends or family in the congregation. Volunteer opportunities or opportunities for involvement. These would be the major uh, motivations, the, the key attributes that research has shown people are trying to find. Now the reality. What does Scripture say? We've already noted Acts 9.26. Paul desired to identify with the church in Jerusalem. Paul was essentially placing membership. Much like Paul was commending Phoebe, when he wrote in Romans 16, 1, I commend unto you our sister Phoebe. He was allowing the church at Rome to know that Phoebe was a member in good standing and essentially vouching for her so that they would indeed receive her into the membership, recognized and identified with them. There's a reality, and the reality is in the New Testament there's plenty of example of Christians placing membership with specific congregations. There's also... Acts 9.29. Now after Paul and tried, came and tried to uh, join himself with the church at Jerusalem and the brethren were, as we said, a bit skittish, Barnabas came and he brought Paul to the apostles and he explained how Jesus had spoke with him on the road to Damascus, how he had taught in the name of the Lord there in Damascus and all that uh, had occurred. And so he was readily received and he was in, going in and out among them day by day right up to the point that there arose some heat. Paul would, Saul as we call him at that point in Scripture, would debate with others about the cross and about Christ. 
And as a result of his debating and his interaction with the Jews, there arose a bit more pressure on the church there in Jerusalem. It's worded this way, verse 29, He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Grecians, and they went about to slay him. When the brethren knew it, they brought him forth, and they said, Paul, you've got to get out of here. Question. How much of the pressure do you think was just the result of him disputing with the Grecians? And how much of it do you think was because he had once stood on their side and now he's on the opposite sideline? He's for the other team. How much of the heat came out of a resentment because of a past connection to him that the other side felt? And he had been such a lead voice in the persecution of Christians. The point we're making is this. Paul's past played into his ability to be there in Jerusalem with the church. And the brethren told him, Paul, you're in danger. You need to be out of here. There are times when the past can actually uh, result in an impact on the present. Paul's presence brought heat and so his leaving would benefit all. So he would depart. Acts 11. He left and he went to uh, Tarsus in Cilicia. And he is there in Tarsus and Cilicia until Barnabas learns of a congregation in Antioch. The brethren in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch to encourage this congregation of a mixed demographic, Jewish background, Gentile background Christians, all seeming to thrive together. Paul, uh, Barnabas rather arrives in Antioch. He sees the state of the church there, Acts 11.25, and he goes to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And he brings Saul back to Antioch where they labor with the church for a year. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. After a time in Tarsus, he was needed in Antioch. And so Barnabas went and brought him there. We'll return to this thought in a moment, but for now advance forward. Paul and Barnabas, what a pair. They were the two that would take a certain gift from the brethren in Antioch down to Jerusalem. They were the pair that upon returning at the end of Acts 12, at the beginning of Acts 13, the, the Holy Spirit calls them to a specific purpose, a mission, a work, a ministry. And they go off on what is called the first missionary journey. And after traveling through Asia Minor, they return to Antioch, and then they take a trip down to Jerusalem to deal with an issue pertaining to those that wanted to bind circumcision, Acts 15. Then at the end of Acts 15, they come back, and they're ready to go on missionary trip number two, the second missionary journey. But there was someone who left them high and dry on the first trip. He just so happens to be a kinsman of Barnabas. His name's John Mark. Acts 15.39, there arose a contention between them. It was sharp. Paul refused to take John Mark. Barnabas insisted that he go. And the contention was so sharp between them that they parted ways. Here are two good brethren that decided it would be better if they worked in different places because of their strong convictions about another brother who had let them down previously. And so Paul would take Silas and go into Asia Minor. Barnabas would take John Mark and he would go to Cyprus, which by the way was uh, Barnabas' home region anyway. So in many ways Barnabas went to his home area. Paul went to what would be known as his home area. And they maximized their work. Benefited all. Interestingly, later in biblical history... The only other mention that Paul gives of Barnabas, 1 Corinthians 9, 6, does not say he's too hard-headed for me to work with him. 1 Corinthians 9, 6, all Paul has to say about Barnabas is, do not Barnabas and I both have the right to lead about a wife just like the other apostles? Don't we have the right to forbear working? He spoke of Barnabas as on par with him in terms of rights, privileges, and duties of a Christian. Paul would endorse Barnabas. When they parted ways, they did not part fellowship. When they parted ways, they just decided to work in different areas for the benefit of all. They did not deride or disdain one another. There are times when good brethren are going to be better off working apart from each other than with each other. Another thought. 1 John 2, 19. John would say concerning the heretics of his day, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they were of us, they would have continued with us. 
but they went out from us that it might be manifest they are not of us. There are times when those who are leaving are the actual problem. And that's a question that has to be asked by those that are looking at relocating. Are my reasons me running from my problems? Or are my reasons because I might be the problem? That's not always the case. Frequently, the, the exact opposite is the case. Nevertheless, it's a question that honest Christians must ask themselves. And then there's Revelation 3, verse 4. Jesus speaking to the church at Sardis, the one that has a name that they live, yet they're dead, Revelation 3, 1. And he says, there are a few names, even among you at Sardis, that have not defiled their robes. They'll walk before me in white, for they are worthy. Even the dead church had pure souls. Which means we need to be really cautious about labeling brethren as in error, when there seem to be some troubling circumstances with the congregations where they might be. Because if Jesus was still willing to recognize sound brethren and faithful brethren in the church at Sardis, it is highly possible that there are still sound and faithful brethren in some congregations that are struggling. We'll deal with that more in a bit also. The reality Having considered some reasons, some responsibility, uh, some research and the reality, now responsibility. What should saints remember? Well, simply based on the passages we just noted, remember that each Christian has a right to decide where he places membership. Paul did. Saul could decide whether to stay in Antioch, whether to go uh, stay in Damascus, go to Jerusalem, go to Tarsus, go to Antioch. It was his call. Yes, there was some inspiration involved in Saul's decisions. For us, it's a matter of prudence. Saul made the choice of where he needed to be. You have the right to decide where you place membership. Also, elders and leaders of congregations have the right to make decisions as well. It's only been four years ago when we were dealing with that thing called COVID. And there were congregations that needed to make decisions regarding their worship schedule and regarding practices. And elderships at that time had every responsibility to make decisions that would look out for the overall best interest of the congregation. And sometimes that involves looking out for the best physical interest. As it's been illustrated before, a congregation in New Orleans when a hurricane is coming won't meet on Sunday because they're looking out for the best overall interest of the members. Well, with COVID, there was a storm coming, but it was a different sort of storm. Based on the information available, congregations made the best decisions they could. Christians had to make the best decisions they could as well, based on their convictions. Leaders have every right to make the best decisions they can with the best information that they can get. There were congregations in other parts of the country where the leadership was convinced that the best decisions they can make involved insisting that their members wear facial protection and masks. They have that right. If a congregation's leadership can tell its members to wear neutral gang colors because they are near an inner city and they don't want to endanger their members with the community around them, then congregation's leadership can also encourage their members regarding other perceived threats. Just like the members can decide, I don't want to do that. It's time for me to be somewhere else. There are decisions that must be made. Leadership has a responsibility to make decisions for the flock, and members of the flock have the responsibility to make decisions about where they will be. Another truth, a leader or a member can actually ruin his influence to the point that leaving is the best thing for everyone. That was the case with this man named Saul, Paul. Because of his past and because of his convictions, he was not the best person to be working with the, the, the community there in Jerusalem. He brought more heat to the church, more heat to himself, and so it was going to be better for him to be elsewhere. And there are times when maybe it's because of a life lived even before becoming a Christian, maybe it's because of mistakes made after becoming a Christian. Maybe it's because of something that preacher has done or something that elder or deacon never should have done. Some indiscretion that that person's influence with the church and with the community has been so compromised that it's going to be better to be elsewhere. If it was the case with Saul, it can be the case today. 
And so that was a consideration that needed to be taken into the picture. Another thing to keep in mind is that when Barnabas went to, Ant to Cilicia to get Paul and bring him to Antioch, Scripture does not say Barnabas went to Tarsus for to steal at the sheep. Yet how many people would be accusing Barnabas of sheep stealing because he saw what was needed and he went and he enlisted Paul to come to Antioch to help. Oh, please understand, there are congregations that are all about sheep stealing and their measurement of success is how many people are sitting in the pew keeping the pads warm and they're not trying to reach souls in the community. All, all they want to do is to have numbers on a board. There's a problem there. But Barnabas was not stealing sheep when he brought a worker to Antioch that helped in the overall work of that church that was already a working church. So, thoughts to keep in mind. Barnabas wasn't sheep stealing. And saints can disagree and depart. Who was right and who was wrong when Saul and Barnabas disagreed? I don't know. And to be honest, neither do you. Maybe both were right. Maybe both were wrong. Maybe both got a little too mad. Or maybe both were acting in absolute wisdom when their contention was sharp, but their love for each other was so strong they said, we're not going to agree over the ultimate outcome of this. Let's make the most of our efforts and go our separate ways. Never a one saying a negative thing about the other. The only report we have of it is an inspired report through the pen of Luke years after the fact. There are times when good brethren are going to do better works when they go in different directions. That's not to say that either is in sin. That's simply to say that there are times when personalities and convictions might be something that God is using in order to take two very uh, capable individuals and position them where they're going to make the most of their capability. If God and His providence can use heathen nations to accomplish His purposes, then He can also use Christians' personalities, however strong or however flawed they may seem to be, in order to accomplish His purposes as well. Those who are quick to leave are often the problem, another idea that has to be kept in mind. And then... Even questionable congregations can have righteous members. Now, all of this to lead up to the reasonings. We've looked at reasons. We've looked at the uh, research for percentages of what the motivations are. We've looked at the responsibilities. We've looked at the reality per scripture. What are the reasonings? Now, these are not necessarily matters of right and wrong. These are going to be matters of what's wise or what's wiser what's good or what's best, or what's the best decision that can be made based on the available information. Seven considerations. Number one, consider what's best for the home, your home. 1 Timothy 5, 8, If any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now while that passage is absolutely dealing with taking responsibility for caring for the members of a household or extended family that are not able to care for themselves, particularly widows, there's a principle contained there that is broad and all-encompassing. We have a responsibility to our homes. I am a Christian, I am a husband, I am a father, I am a preacher. In that order, you, whatever your role, whatever your gender, whatever your marital status, if you're able to check those boxes as yes, you are first and foremost a Christian. Then you are a spouse. Then you are a parent. Then you are whatever occupation you hold. It's important for us to keep those things in mind because our responsibility to God as individual Christians involves our responsibility to the church as a whole, yes, but we also have a responsibility to our families and there are times when our responsibility to family might require that we best serve our family by being elsewhere. Why is that? Well, maybe it's a matter of safety. 
Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. How many husbands that love their wives would drive them through a, a Beirut style shootout every day just to get to the grocery store? How many fathers that love their children would put them through the same? There are times when perhaps a, a congregation's location is not safe. There's a reason why the, the Forest Hill congregation is located where it is now instead of its previous location and, and the storied place over at Knight Arnold, as it was once called, and safety played into it. The point being this, just like the leadership of a congregation has a responsibility to make decisions that look out for the safety of the church, so also each member in each household has a responsibility to make those sorts of considerations as well. And maybe it's a matter of what's best for the home, the family safety, or maybe it's a matter of stewardship. We love worshiping with this congregation, but we drive six hours every Sunday to get there, and it's wearing us out in gas money. Okay then maybe it's time to plant a sound congregation within three hours instead of driving so far. Dismissing the hyperbole, you get the point. There are times when maybe it's a matter of stewardship, or maybe not just of time. Maybe it's a, a matter of money. Maybe it's a matter of stewardship of responsibilities. Maybe it's a matter of convenience. And then there are times we have to be really careful with that word convenience. What's best for your home? Some homes involve married couples. Some homes involve formerly married individuals. Some homes have a mom and dad with children. Some homes have a parent with children. Sometimes home circumstances change. So maybe it's a move that requires the consideration. Maybe it's a marriage or maybe, maybe it's a, a widowhood or a divorce where she's saying, I, I can't continue to worship there. I have too many memories. I have too many memories and he's not with me anymore. Or maybe he's saying, I can't continue worship there because she's still there and we're not together. And I'm going to be so focused on her, I can't focus on my Lord. Uh, focus on my Lord. It's not a matter of necessarily what's easiest. It's a matter of what's going to be best. So what's going to be best for the home? Those are considerations that have to be made. And those are considerations where there might not be an absolute right or a wrong answer, but there might be one that's going to be best or most conducive to being able to serve and to worship most effectively. Next, consider what's best for the Lord's church as a whole. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What's going to be best for the church? Here are some of the considerations that often get utilized. Well, if I start worshiping with this congregation, I'll be able to strengthen them. They really need some folks over there. That might be the case. It is highly possible that that's the case. And for the brethren that are able to make that sort of decision and make that sort of contribution and help a congregation truly to grow and to be effective in doing the Lord's work in that community, that's spectacular. But how often is it the case a congregation doesn't need strength and what it needs to do is consolidate? There are times when the idea of you need to come and help strengthen us is really we need your contribution and we need to know that we have your, your number on that attendance board. There are times when the idea of strength in a congregation is not helping it to do the work of edifying the church or evangelizing the lost or exercising benevolence. There are times when many congregations' idea of strengthening the church is just to have warm bodies. And so an honest assessment needs to be made. What is the, the need? What, what, am I, what am I proposing to do? Does strengthening a congregation compromise the family? Because if strengthening a congregation requires compromising the, uh, the time that's needed with family or the responsibilities to family or the instruction that the family is able to receive, if it's going to put them in a, a, a more compromised situation because of someone that's there that, that has a history of indiscretions, or if it's going to put them in a situation where the teaching is less than solid, am I going to compromise my family 
simply to help a congregation when we could well be doing the Lord's work soundly, safely, and surely in another place. Does my moving membership stir unnecessary hornet's nests? Because let's face it, there are times when brethren can move from one congregation to another in the general area, but in so doing, there are those underlying conflicts. And there are times when no one even remembers what the initial conflict was about, but you've still got two congregations within three miles of each other, and no one from here goes there, and no one from there goes here, and no one really knows why. Am I going to stir unnecessary hornet's nests? Or could it be the case that the efforts can actually help to strengthen relationships? Real, viable, legitimate strengthening. Consider what's best for your home. Consider what's best for Christ's church. Consider what's best for fellowship. Reasoning number three. What do we mean by what's best for fellowship? Well, there is a social aspect of the church. There is a sense of belonging that Christians are privileged to be able to enjoy. You look at the record and the history of the first congregation of the Lord's church there in Jerusalem. And they that, uh, they that believed were together, they had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods. They divided every man according as every man had need. And they continuing daily in the temple with one accord, breaking bread from house to house. They eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Acts 2, 44 through 46, they shared all they could share. They had a fellowship and a union and a unity that was exemplary. And it's an example that we must follow today. We think about Acts 4 and the way that they uplifted one another. Neither said any of them that all of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, Acts 4, 32. The way that they helped one another is for us to follow today. Now, when we talk about what's best for fellowship... Are we going to benefit from the fellowship? Have we benefited from fellowship uh, of a congregation in the area that, that has raised the bar, so to speak? It is very much the case that throughout the land there are congregations that are just going to church. And brethren, there's a difference between, go between going to church and being a Christian. There's a difference between going through the motions and walking in the light. That's important because there are congregations that they don't understand fellowship with God. They don't understand fellowship with one another. Yet when members of those congregations see, see fellowship in action, see what fellowship looks like among congregations that have a better understanding, it can be contagious. And sometimes... Sometimes members from those congregations will simply move to be with the congregation that exercises fellowship. Sometimes they'll endeavor to instill some of the things they are seeing in the minds of the others that are with the, the, the flock where they worship. It's a great thing when it takes. It can be disappointing when it doesn't. But the question has to be asked, what's best for fellowship? If I'm considering leaving this smaller congregation because of the fellowship that's available with the larger one, that's great. Is there an opportunity to instill bonds of fellowship in this smaller congregation before I make that decision? Or sometimes it might even be vice versa. What's going to be best for fellowship? Is it needed within the flock where you're a member? Or is it simply the case that I need it and I'm not going to get it where I might be? Consider what's best for your home, for the church, for fellowship. Consider what's best for growth. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, Paul said, We heard of your growth in faith. For faith to grow, there has to be time spent in God's Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10.17. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he spoke of the necessity for growth. Ephesians 4, picking up at verse 13 Paul would speak to them regarding the, uh, all coming to the fullness of faith, the, the perfect man, the knowledge of the Son of God. There were no more to be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now keep in mind, he's speaking of ideas such as growing, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
No more children. In Ephesians 4, 15, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into Him in all things. There is a place for the concept of growth applied congregationally, which was what Paul was doing in Ephesians 4, speaking of the, the, the church overall. For the church to grow, individual members need to be growing. And a church will not grow where the membership is stagnant. Where am I growing? 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When the pulpit is stagnant, when the Bible classes are stagnant, when the involvement is stagnant, the time spent in God's word is stagnant, then that's not growth. It's a dangerous situation. We're to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3, 18. We're to be going from those that are on the milk of the word, Hebrews 5, 12, to, to, to those that are, that are on meat, which, by the way, involves having our senses exercised to discern both good and evil by reason of use, Hebrews 5, 14. Are we where we're growing or are we where we're treading water, staying still and not moving? Is there a depth of teaching? Are we looking for a depth of teaching that will challenge us? Are there involvement opportunities? Are we looking for a place where we're able to leave a comfort zone or where we can hide in a crowd? What's the motivation? There are Christians that have been members at one place for 20, 25 years that finally decided it was time to be elsewhere. And in the first year, they grew more than they had in the previous 20 to 25. I can guarantee it because they're family members of mine. There are places where Christians just aren't growing because it's not a ripe environment for growth. The question is, do we desire to grow and are we going to look for what's the best ground for growth? What's best for the home? What's best for the church? What's best for fellowship, for growth? What's going to be best for worship? John 4, 24, God is spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Are we looking at putting ourselves where we will truly be able to worship in spirit with a proper attitude and a mind focused on worship because, because the attitude can be contagious? In a good way or in a bad? And are we looking where we can truly worship in truth? Revelation 3, 4. Jesus said that there were those among the church at Sardis that hadn't defiled their garments. The question is, when it gets to the point that we can't worship in truth because the actual dictates and standards of worship have been changed, whatever the aspect of worship might be, whether the congregation is changing the regularity of the Lord's Supper, the personalities that are presenting the message or, or leading in aspects of worship, or the details of praise, whatever the case may be, when it gets to the point that the worship has departed from the New Testament pattern, can we still be claimed to be worshiping in truth? Can I worship in spirit? Can I worship in truth? And can I worship in peace? What do we mean, can I worship in peace? Well, exactly that. Because there are places where peace is not an option. Now, Paul would say, Romans 12, 18, if it be possible as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And he was talking to Christians as it pertained to their relationship with one another and their relationship with the community around them. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. And in that chapter, he gave the mandate for if you go to worship and you're, you remember your brother hath ought against you, you leave your uh, offering before the altar, you go re be reconciled with your brother. We can't worship soundly when we're not at peace with our brethren. There are some folks with whom it's impossible to have peace. The point here simply being this. Are we looking for peace? Is it a congregation that's conducive to peace? When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he chastised them because of the envying and strife that was among them, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. James would say that the wisdom that is from above is pure and peaceful, gentle. But, but he would say concerning the, the wisdom that's from below, worldly wisdom, strife, confusion, every evil work. If it's a congregation where there's constant bickering and underlying dissension, if it's a congregation where it's always argument and no agape, we have to ask the question, is it not only conducive for worship but for peacemaking? Am I doing my part to reconcile? Or here's a question, 
Could it be that, I'm just turning and running, there are those that instead of making peace, they just make tracks. Again, we're just asking the questions that need to be asked when these, these options are being considered. And then finally, what's best for the home? What's best for the church? What's best for fellowship, for growth, for worship, for peacemaking? And what's going to be best for soundness? Titus 2, 1, speak the words that are according to sound doctrine, Titus. Is it sound? Am I seeking a preacher or teacher to tell me what I want to hear? Because how many times have we seen people be willing to leave sound congregations to go and tell, uh, find someone else that will tell them what they want to hear as it pertains to God's law for the home and marriage and divorce and remarriage? How often have we seen people leave sound congregations to find someone that will tell them what they want to hear as it pertains to some moral behavior? Paul warned Timothy that after their own lust, they'll heat to themselves teachers having itching ears, 2 Timothy 4, 3. They'll be turned away from the truth. They'll be turned unto fables. There are those that seek to leave sound congregations because they're looking for a completely different sound. Now, there are some that are with congregations that are questionable because they're trying to curb those questionable influences. See again, Revelation 3, 4. But then there are others that have stopped curbing and started compromising. At which point we've got a different story. Consider what's best for soundness, not just for self, but for family. Pray. Having noted these seven considerations, pray, 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 pray. Pray, pray, pray. Pray about what's best for the home, for the church, for the fellowship, for the growth, for the worship, for peacemaking. Pray about what's best for soundness. Every Christian has the right to choose of which congregation will I be a part. How are we using that liberty? Paul would warn the brethren in Galatia, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. How are we using that liberty? Selfless? President John F. Kennedy, in his inaugural address, made the following unforgettable statement. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. There's much to commend about the statement. But when it comes to these considerations, perhaps we could reword it. Ask what the congregation can do for you, but only if you also ask what you can do for the congregation. Because there is indeed a mutual benefit and a relationship when we're talking about these ideas. Now, maybe it's the case you've never been added to the Lord's church. We're not talking about uh, changing a congregation. We're talking about changing stripes. We're talking about changing garments. We're talking about changing the entire life if you've never been baptized into Jesus' name. If you've never been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, if you've never become a New Testament Christian, are you ready? Are you ready to be added to Christ's church? Maybe it's the case this afternoon that as you think about those considerations we've mentioned, you find yourself looking at yourself and thinking, I've not been what's doing what was best for my home, what was best for the church. I've not been doing what was best for fellowship or worship or peacemaking. I've not been doing what was best for, for any of these. I've not been doing what was best for my relationship with God. If that's the case, are you ready to make a change? Are you ready to come forward? Are you ready to repent? If so, the opportunity is extended while we stand and while we sing.